my hair. Would you like to offer this one? Yeah? <laughs> Great. Otherwise I have to just see it, I can just look at it, you know, that's not so nice. Thank you. <laughs> that's really good. Okay. Okay, everyone, so let's uh, get started. Uh, and uh, Venerable, if you would like to say anything, please do so at any time. Jump in. If you want to add anything, you know, uh, that's you're always welcome to do so. Okay, so let us uh, continue where we left off yesterday. There's quite a few questions here, which is great. Uh, so let's see what, what happens. Uh, okay, Ajahn, do I understand correctly that the wisdom is needed to be around in all the factors of enlightenment. Thank you. Uh, um, so uh, you are asking whether wisdom is required uh, f around all the factors so that they are part of all the factors of enlightenment, uh, something like that. Uh, that kind of su wisdom supports all those factors, uh, yeah? Okay. Um, yes. Uh, that is true. Wisdom is always useful. Yeah, the more wisdom you have uh, at any stage of the path, uh, the more ability you have to deal with the problems and you have to do the right, uh, get the right thing. Uh. And one of the things uh, later on uh, during this retreat, I will have a look at the 37 Bodhipakya Dharmas, the 37 aids to awakening. And uh, of those 37, 37 factors, you have the five faculties, uh, the five indriyas, uh, and those five indriyas, you have the wisdom faculty at the top. And uh, the wisdom faculty is there specifically said to support and stabilize the other four faculties. Uh, so when you have wisdom, everything else on the path tends to stabilize as a consequence. So wisdom is always the most important one of all these, these things. Uh, so, um, but initially, wisdom is almost like just understanding the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, the more you understand them, it's almost like as if you are taking on board the Buddha's wisdom. Uh, and by taking on board his wisdom, uh, you are, uh, if, even if though initially you may not actually really have that wisdom yourself because you haven't seen it properly for yourself, you're acting it out in such a way that eventually you will get there. Uh, yeah, so this, this is really what it is, uh, how it works. So, uh, and one of the things that is, I think, very important to realize about the way the path of meditation works is that sometimes we talk about the distinction between vipassana meditation and samatha meditation as if they are two separate types of meditation practice. Vipassana being inside, samatha being calm meditation. But uh, really, they are just two aspects of the same thing. The way that the Buddha never talks about vipassana meditation is a modern expression that has been invented, you know, fairly recently. Uh, so it's just a, it's just a kind of a it's a word that is being used to explain meditation practice, uh, and there's nothing wrong with it as such. But it's important to understand that the Buddha just talked about meditation, bhavana, for example, anapanasati, uh, watching the breath we would be one of those. Uh, and when you practice these things, two things happen together, and that is samatha and vipassana calm and clear seeing, I prefer clear seeing as a translation of vipassana, are the outcome, both of those are the outcome of meditation. They always come together, you cannot really separate them. Uh, and clear seeing is very similar to wisdom. Uh, yeah, so you can see that the more you, the more you, uh, the more calmer you are, the deeper your samadhi is, uh, the more wisdom you will have, almost by default, it comes with it, uh, it is part of it. Uh, or rather you have more clear seeing, and that clear seeing in turn is the foundation for wisdom. The more th you see clearly, uh, the more wisdom you tend to get. You see clearly again and again and again, and then it starts to sink in, uh, and you become wise as a consequence of that. Uh, uh <coughs> there's a nice little verse in the Dhammapada where the Buddha says that, um, he says there's no uh, jhana without wisdom. There's no wisdom without jhana, but the one who has both wisdom and jhana is in the vicinity, is uh, close to nibbana. Yeah, so you cannot have jhana without wisdom. That's what he's saying there. 
So when people say, oh, you know, you, you sometimes you hear this idea that uh, people are just practicing samatha without vipassana and you're kind of enjoying jhanas or whatever, but it's actually impossible to have jhanas without insight uh, or, or wisdom. Uh, and part of the insight you have when you practice jhanas, uh, because you have gone beyond the sensory world, the world of the five senses, uh, you understand the five senses, uh, you understand their problem, their dukkha, the, the unsatisfactoriness of that realm, their impermanence and all of these things. Uh, so already you actually have a lot of insight already just by attaining the five jhanas, four jhanas, five jhanas. Yeah, actually there is five al also. There is, a, there is a, a category of five jhanas as well, so that wasn't really wrong, but it was still a, I didn't really mean to say that. Uh. So, um, uh, yeah, so wisdom is supportive all the way, uh, and in fact it is part and parcel of meditation practice. Uh. <laughs> Now, what what about people that don't have any wisdom and they want to practice in order to gain wisdom? If you want to practice, you have wisdom. Yeah, otherwise you wouldn't want to wouldn't want to practice. <laughs> so the fact that you want to practice is already wisdom. <laughs> well, yeah, not not really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, mm -mm. you know, yeah. when uh, we start practicing. Yeah. The wisdom may be kind of, you know, knowledge. Yeah. You know, basic knowledge. And uh, yeah. once you, we uh, practice more and more, yeah. then we gain, you know, knowledge yeah. become wisdom. Yeah. Yeah, true. But uh, I, I think also, you know, that, that's, I, I agree with you. So in the beginning it is quite, quite shallow. But one of the nice things the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, he says that, uh, uh, the ignorant person who thinks they're wise, they are really ignorant. But the ignorant person who knows they're ignorant, they are wise to that extent. So already, you know, sometimes very simple things can be a degree of wisdom. And the idea that you want to practice, to me, that's already a sign that you have some understanding. Because yeah. most people don't want to practice. Uh, they want to kind of chill out, they want to you know, enjoy the world, their things and that kind of stuff. Uh, so I think already there, there is some kind of understanding. But I agree with you, it's shallow. And it's not yeah. really experiential, perhaps. It uh -huh. is kind of, it isn't very deep yet. So you, the depth really starts to happen later on. Huh? Yeah. So, so what do you, so, so, yes, and <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything more? <laughs> well, uh, you know, the, for some people, if, if we talk about wisdom, wisdom, you know, you have to need to, to work all the way through. What if, you know, if they think that they don't have wisdom yet, then they might be discouraged. Uh, you put it closer to your mouth, the, the microphone, I think. Yeah. I you are making noise or this, this is too loud. I think it's just the one at the back is trying to adjust it. That's why it, it, you've got the noise. Put it, put it closer to your mouth, otherwise you can't hear properly. Yeah. Try that, yeah. Yeah. Well, did you hear? Did you hear? Closer <laughs> to your mouth, yeah. I I forgot That's what I said now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was yeah. say, saying that uh, in case, you know, people that they don't think they have enough wisdom, they, that's why they want to practice, to gain wisdom. Mm. What if we say that it takes, you know, wisdom to go all the way through, then uh, they might be discouraged. Yeah, I, I, I think it's just how you, probably how you put it, yeah? And you can encourage them by saying, you're already wise, you know that you have to practice, yeah? So you tell them, you already, you already have some degree of wisdom, that's how you encourage people. <laughs> so, and it's also true, it's not just a kind of, just an encouragement, it's actually truth to it. And then you tell them that as you practice, the wisdom comes with the practice, the practice comes with the wisdom, two pillars come together, uh -huh. they grow together, and then I think people will kind of, uh, be encouraged by, by that kind of, you know, uh, yeah. attitude, yeah. Something like that? Uh. Well, when I start practicing, I didn't think about any wisdom or anything, we just... You, you just know, start, yeah. Just start. That, exactly, and I think that's what happened to many people. They kind of just have a feeling, this is a good thing to do, and they do that as a, con you know, and then they kind of, they kind of find their way as they go about these things. Uh. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. 
Er. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Dear Anjan, thanks for the deathbed contemplation last last year. Last year, I just did it this this morning. <laughs> Could we add a could we add a skillful way of ignoring the pains in our body, or rather, how to separate mind and body during uh, an our deathbed? Okay, uh, I see what you're trying to get to here. Could we add a skillful way of ignoring the pains in our body, and rather, how to separate mind and body during? Uh, and on our deathbed. Okay, I see what you mean here. Um, the uh, yes, you you can. Uh, this is kind of one of the difficulties of the uh, deathbed. Uh, very often, people often have pains because they may have some serious illness and all of these kind of things. And this is what can make death very difficult. Uh, I just heard of somebody who had passed away in lots of pain because they died from lung cancer, I think, or something like that. And lung cancer can be very painful, apparently, uh, especially during the dying process. But uh, it can be very hard to separate these things because it is maybe a little bit easier on your deathbed because you know you're dying, so you have more ability to let go of things. Uh, but even then it's difficult, just like it is difficult during meditation to kind of ignore the pain altogether. It's not going to be easy on your deathbed either. And I would recommend people take some painkillers, yeah? Use that even while you're dying. I know sometimes it is said that in Buddhism we should die without using painkillers or any kind of drugs, but I, I don't really agree with that, to be honest. Because uh, I, what happens in the dying process, and it is what is so interesting about it uh, is that as you are dying uh, your mind and body are already separating so even though you are a bit drugged out uh, initially uh, uh, the closer you get to death uh, the more clarity you tend to get it's just like i was saying uh, the other day about alzheimer's patients yeah sometimes you have alzheimer's and you are really out of it until the very last minutes before you die and suddenly you regain your consciousness again your awareness your memories and everything yeah. And it's the same thing with painkillers. You use painkillers uh, as you're dying, but then towards the very end, uh, because the mind separates from the physical body, the, phys the painkillers only work on the physical body. They've got nothing to do with the mind. So when the mind releases, uh, your clarity comes back anyway. And then you are back where you were before, uh, and you can continue with your mindfulness, and you can continue to do the right things. Uh. So using painkiller doesn't really stop you from having a good death. In fact, I think very often the opposite, because if you have too much pain, it can lead to, you know, maybe it can lead to a delusion, or it can lead to maybe you get angry about things, because pain you have means you have less patience and all kind of stuff. So I think it is better to um, have something which calms these things down, and that actually would uh, be preferable during the death, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, that's, that's my preferred way of getting rid of pain. I don't know, <laughs> using drugs, yeah, this is what most people do these days. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, if you don't agree with that, come back tomorrow and then tell me off and say, what? You can't say that or whatever you want to say. So, because there are different, different opinions about this, but that is my, my take on these things. So. I have, a, well, my personal experience, when I had a toothache, very bad. And um, at night, uh, very painful. And uh, some teacher they in Thailand, they teach, uh, you know, to meditate, to separate Nama and Rupa. So I tried that. It, it worked. You know, I didn't feel, you know, hmm. the pain. I could sleep all night. Yeah. Just, you know, meditate on that pain and separate the the pain and uh, the gum, <laughs> you know, nama rupa mind, mind body separation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And it, it worked, and I I slept through. Otherwise, it was very painful. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Excellent. So that's uh, so that may work, but uh, there is no guarantee it will work every time. It may not work straight away. It may take a ah. while before it works. It's hard to know exactly how and. It's hard, you know, to control it can be very, very difficult. Uh. But c you could still feel the pain, but not cruciate yeah. kind of pain. Otherwise, you know, it would be very 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so how do you do that? Uh, do you want to give some instructions? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I just, you know, uh, mindful of the pain. Yeah. And then, you know, by a very strong mindfulness on, on that pain, and uh, eventually it will just separate the pain and the uh, come. Mm. You just, you know, have to be really very strong concentration on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Okay. I just try and I did never did try before, but I heard you know they you can separate nama rupa mm. the pain it's and nama the rupa parichayda nyana one of the nyanas in the Visuddhi Magga. That's what they kind of what it refers to usually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just tried it, but it you know it seemed to work yeah. pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Huh? Yeah. So if you have no painkillers, then use this other method. Huh? Focus on it. No, the painkiller yeah. didn't work. Didn't work. Yeah, yeah I took okay. the pill, but it, it didn't work. Okay. It was very crucial. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's another good reason then to use that, use that method here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Venerable. Uh, yeah. Let us move on to the next one. Now. Dear Ajahn, aren't there three types of Buddha? Samma, Sambuddha, Pacheka Buddha, and the one who achieves enlightenment by listening to the Dhamma. Doesn't Buddha mean the awakened one? Um, three types of Buddha. There are um, three types of awakened beings, perhaps. Uh, Samma Sambuddha, which is the, uh, the Buddha in the suttas, and also other Buddhas that arise every now and again. Uh, Pacheka Buddha, individual Buddha, private Buddha, the Buddha who awakens to the truth also on their own, but who don't have any disciples. They just live on, they just relax and chill and don't really teach anyone. Uh, that's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and the one who achieves enlightenment by listening to the Dhamma, that's kind of the Arahant, yeah? The one who is the disciple of a Buddha. Huh? Doesn't Buddha mean the awakened one? It does, uh, that's what it means. So all of these three are awakened and they have all achieved the same level of awakening. The difference is only their, whether they are the first one or whether they have disciples and this kind of thing. That's really the only, only difference to these things. Uh, uh, they're not normally called three types of Buddhas. Uh, usually, they are. They have. You know, uh, they're usually called Samma Sambuddha, Pacheka Buddha, and Arahant. Is usually what they are are called. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, and as I mentioned early on, the word Buddha is still used in certain of the Indo-European languages, uh, and it, mean it means like to wake up. So you wake up in the morning, then you are Buddha. That's quite easy, isn't it? Uh, that's the easy way to be Buddha: is wake up in the morning. Uh, Bang, you're a Buddha, you're a Buddha. But that's the fourth kind of Buddha, yeah? It doesn't count. <laughs> doesn't count on this list. <laughs> okay, that's, are you happy with that? So if, again, if you're not happy with my replies, please just write again and we'll see what happens tomorrow. Dear Ajahn, when we see a bright nimitta in the meditation, do we still continue watching the breath like normal? Thank you. If you see a really bright nimitta in your meditation that is quite stable, uh, and it is, uh, you know, it is not just fluctuating or uh, there's a danger that it will disappear quickly. You can uh, shift your attention from the breath to that nimitta. And that nimitta is what then will take you all the way into jhana if you practice it appropriately. Yeah. Keep your attention on that uh, and it will take you all the way in. Uh. But you have to be careful because nimittas can be very fragile. Uh. Yeah, they can be unstable or not very powerful, not very strong. Uh, and when they are not, and when you shift your attention, they may disappear. Uh, so there may be a point when you ha can you use both at the same time. You both have the breath and you also have the visual nimitta at the same time. Uh, and you kind of work them together. Uh, and then the nimitta brightens up uh, and eventually you let go of the breath completely. Uh, the breath may even still be there, but kind of very faint in the background. Uh, and then the nimitta becomes the main object. Uh, so you kind of gradually move across from one to the other. Uh, and um, Sometimes you need to experiment a little bit to find out for yourself what works. A lot of meditation and overcoming hindrances and over, you know, making progress really should be based on your own experience. 
you do these things and then you learn how these things work. Because we're all slightly different and what uh, one person says may not kind of be how you experience things in your, in your life and in your meditation practice. Uh, so a lot of it is, uh, you know, has, to, has to be your own personal experience dealing with these things and then finding ways through it uh, and then moving, moving on. Uh, that's, how, that's how I see it. We uh, go straight to China without uh, Nimita? <laughs> uh, this is a kind of one of those old questions. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think um, uh, it, it's very dif it's difficult to say. To me, I, the, the what, the what usually the people I know who have jhanas experiences, uh, uh, who I feel I'm fairly certain have some really good experiences with meditation, I think most of them, maybe all of them, went through an imita stage. Uh, so I think it is very likely to be required. Uh, so I'm not sure about that. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, Sometimes, you know, the uh, Nimitta doesn't take all the way to jhana, just stay there. Yeah. But uh, sometimes, you know, it seems like I can just go straight through, I, but I don't know if jhana or not. But, uh, uh, <laughs> mm. but it seems like, you know, mm. it, you just go straight up. Yeah. I, I think you can. You think you can? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, uncertain. I, certainly, the uh, the standard way that is described in most places is uh, going through the uh, nimitta. If you, you know, if you look at the sutta like the Upakilesa sutta that we had looked at before, which was the sutta where the Buddha goes out and he talks to Anuruddha, Kimbila, and Nandiya, and then he asks them, "How you attain an uttarimanusa dhammas and the superhuman qualities?" Uh, and they say, "We see lights and visions of forms." Uh, remember that uh, those of you who were here at the beginning for the life of the Buddha. And that l those lights and visions of forms, they are ex basically what we call nimittas uh, in meditation. And then the Buddha tells you how to deal with those nimittas, uh, how to deal with the defilements that are there, still there with those nimittas, uh, and then how to overcome those defilements uh, so that you go into the jhanas. The process you see there is exactly that. You see the lights, forms, forms and lights come together, uh, the overcoming of the refined hindrances that are still there, and then the jhanas, which is pretty much what you would expect if, you know, when nimittas are, uh, are part of the path. Okay. Only light nimittas? Uh, that, that's the, the, well that, that, that is the one, the visual nimitta is the one I, yet I'm talking about, uh, yeah. Only the light? I, I think so, yes. Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, there are different limiters, right? But, you know, light is one of them. Yeah. Yes, that there are. But I think there's something that happens when the mind, bec because the mind becomes very bright, yeah, and it, it tends to see. Maybe minds, maybe some minds work differently, but uh, you tend to experience the world visually. It's a very important part of how we experience the world. So I, I suspect that the when we see, when the mind becomes very beautiful, that's probably how we tend to understand the mind. I don't know if it is absolutely required, uh, but I think it is a very, it's a kind of natural thing. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that, but uh, what, I, what I do know is that this is the major what the majority of people do. Uh, and I, th I know that many people who don't have light limiters and they think they have jhanas, they haven't actually got it. Uh, there's something less. So in my experience, it's, quite, it's a bit dangerous to move into other areas because very often you will I misinterpret those experiences as jhanas when in fact they're not actually the full, uh, the full samadhi yet. Yeah. Well, when you see the light nimitta, where, where do you see it? Well, you see it in your mind's eye, yeah. It's, it's, just, uh, <laughs> it's just there, it's, you, you see it. Uh, yeah. any, any part of the body? I think I think I, th I think most people see it as if this you see it here or something, pretty much in front of your eyes, where you would kind of normally see things, not too far away. But it varies, and, and the kind of the type of nimitta will vary. According, if you read the Visuddhimagga, you can have all kinds of strange nimittas according to the Visuddhimagga, and I think that might be the case. It might it might be it might depend on the person, and the colors may even vary. There may be all kinds of things. 
so again, I don't know the answer to that. I think people, different people, are, have diff probably slightly different experiences. Uh. No, for you, you yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to go into too much into <laughs> into that, uh, but um, yeah. Be anyway, be yes. Because I see different parts, you know. Sometimes forehead. Yeah. Sometimes you know the middle. Okay. The chest. Sometimes it just the eyes, you know. Okay. In the the area. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my experience, what I think is that most people, they have a kind of usual place where the nimitta arises. It uh, tends to be kind of one particular place. Uh, but uh, perhaps it, perhaps that too is different for different people. Uh, mm. Not sure. Uh. Um. Then what do you do with it? That's what you do with it. You, st you stay with it. Yeah, this is what we were talking about the other day. We were looking at the uh, Anapanasati Sutta. Remember that you, the third stage of Anapanasati, the third tetrad is where you have the citta pati sangvedi you experience the mind yeah that is the nimitta and the next one is you gladden the mind uh abhipamoja yang chittang then you have this uh, samadha hang chittang which is like stilling the mind and the last one is vimocha yang chittang which is the releasing the mind so what you do is just stay with it and as you do that it becomes more happy it becomes more bright uh, yeah and then gra and eventually it takes you all the way into the jhana states that is vimocha yang chittang where it's liberated so you just stay with it just like the breath you don't do anything with the breath you just allow the breath to develop as you stay with it and this is really what this is about so it's so it's very pleasant very simple nothing really you need to do which is kind of uh, kind of nice you just you just relax, enjoy the ride, you know? <laughs> That's what it is about. Yeah. Then it disappears. Sure, of course it, of course it disappears. Yeah, it's, not always, it's not stable, it may go. Just like the breath sometimes, you may enjoy it for a while, then it disappears again. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Hi Arjan, where is the best place to start if we're just starting out learning the suttas? Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is a standard question and uh, what I would recommend you to do is to start by uh, reading a book by Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, an anthology of the suttas called In the Buddha's Words. Uh, it is very nice because it is grouped according to various subjects. Uh, so it starts off with the simple subjects like sila and parents and generosity and all of that uh, in the Buddha's words. Uh, and then it also has introductory passages that introduce each section. It explains to you what it is about. Uh, it has uh, footnotes at the end which explains again what is going on. Uh, and uh, then you have uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's translations which are quite good. Uh, sometimes a little bit academic, I feel, because he has a PhD in philosophy, and then when you have a PhD in philosophy, it tends to affect how you write, <laughs> unfortunately. So, so I sometimes prefer Ajahn Sujato's translations, because the, he has deliberately uh, ha used as common, a kind of more common ordinary language, rather than make it highfalutin and kind of, uh, you know, uh, whatever. It's a more common ordinary language, which actually reads really nicely. When I read those Sutta translations, I think they're actually really nice. So start with that one, it's a good way to start. If you find it hard to uh, understand certain suttas, lots of suttas are available online, explained, yeah? A little bit like I explain here now, uh, they are available from, well obviously from my <laughs> myself. Uh, Ajahn Brahm does sutta explanations online, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi does sutta explanations online, you can find sutta explanations by Ajahn Sujato, and by a large number of people who, who do these kind of things. Uh, one of the Malaysian monks, Venerable Dhamma Bhikkhu Dhamma, Venerable Dhamma Vudo, Bhikkhu Hai, up, who has his monastery up in Ippo, he, he does sutta explanations uh, online, so there's lots of people who do this. Uh, and of course sometimes it will be contradictory, yeah? You listen to one, it's not, well, who is right? Uh, you say things different way, but what you find, even if there are contradictions occasionally, you find that many of the main themes will be the same, yeah? A lot of it will be the same, and there will be occasional uh, uh, distinctions and differences. Uh, and one of the differences will be that some people will rely more on the commentaries and the Abhidhamma and Visuddhimagga in the interpretation, uh, Whereas, and I, I sometimes do that as well, but if I, but I try to rely more on the suttas and cross-referencing and that kind of thing instead. Uh, so that for this reason there will be slight differences. Uh. And then uh, once you have done that uh, and you have kind of uh, uh, got a good idea kind of of the essentials, then I, if I were you I would go to the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, 
because they are very beautiful, they are very complete suttas, uh, and they kind of give a complete teaching. If you go to the numerical discourses or the connected discourse, they're often very short, uh, and uh, you don't really feel you get a complete discourse by the Buddha. But imagine it's a complete discourse, and you have the setting, yeah, the Buddha was staying in a certain place, and then a certain monk, or a, some occasionally a nun, uh, or the lay people come and they ask for a teaching and then you kind of have a whole little bit of a story around it and it creates a setting, it creates more of a feeling of being part of the what has happened, what happened in India two and a half thousand years ago. You are kind of part of the audience in a sense. So those suttas are really nice. The, the disadvantage with the Majjhima is that the very first sutta is the most profound sutta in the entire Pali Canon probably. So most people come to the first sutta and then they give up on reading suttas ever after it because they, <laughs> they started off with the most difficult one. So, and this is one of the tricks about reading suttas is that uh, if you don't enjoy a particular sutta, don't read it. Skip it. Go to the next one. Go to find one that you actually enjoy, one that speaks to you, one that you feel, yeah, I can learn something from this one. One that has some beautiful similes in it, some nice metaphors. And one of my favorite suttas, and this is, I think, for many, is a nice sutta, is the Chula Hatti Padopama Sutta, the uh, shorter discourse on the elephant's footprint, uh, Majjhimanikai 27. That was a sutta that was taken to Sri Lanka by Mahinda. Mahinda was Emperor Ashoka's son. He became a monk, and he was the one who started Buddhism in Sri Lanka, according to the story. And one of the suttas that he taught when he got to Sri Lanka was this particular sutta. And that is what kind of turned uh, Sri Lanka around and made Sri Lanka a Buddhist. The king was there, the queen was there, and they all became Buddhist. Yeah, and then you had a Buddhist country after that. Uh, that's the story. I'm not sure if it was quite that simple, but that's kind of the story. Uh, so this was one of the, and it's a very beautiful sutta, and it shows it's a sutta on the gradual training, uh, the whole training from the beginning to the very end. And it's the kind of sutta that I often use when I teach meditation retreats because it gives a beautiful sequence on how to do the practice. So something like that. And then you can read some of the more inspiring parts of the Pali Canon, like the Dhammapada. So you can have the Dhammapada on your little night table next to your bed. And before you go to sleep, yeah, quickly read one verse before you fall asleep. Otherwise, sometimes you read the suttas, oh, you fall asleep because it's so boring. But the good thing about the Dhammapada is that short verses, you, ca you don't really have time to fall asleep until the verse comes to an end. Yeah? That's kind of the nice thing about it. Uh, so you read, <laughs> you read one verse, and uh, sometimes when you read something profound from the Buddha, something which is beautiful, and it maybe if it has been translated in a nice way, so it sounds like a verse or whatever, you feel kind of inspired and uplifted, uh, and it's a great way of falling to sleep. Uh, so even if you don't do any metta meditation before you go to bed, uh, this already can lift you up a little bit. Uh. So this is my, uh, the way I uh, look at this. Uh. Okay, let's go on to the next one. If you want to say something about this, please interfere at any time. Uh. And just, uh, not, I don't mean interfere, just, I mean just uh, jump in at any time. Uh. <laughs> Next one. Can a person become enlightened even while they're still alive? Absolutely. Uh, uh, certainly you can. Be, otherwise, if, if it only happens after you're dead, then it's not the same thing. Yeah? Otherwise, we wouldn't have a Buddha. That's kind of the point of the Buddha. How, how, do, we know, how do we know we're enlightened? <laughs> do, do, they know, do, they, do they know it themselves? Thank you, Sadhu times three. Okay. Absolutely, while you're still alive, because that's what the Buddha is. The Buddha was alive and he was enlightened. And uh, some of his main disciples too were Arahants, yeah, so they were alive and they were enlightened. Uh, is that what you mean, or do you mean I I while you're still a lay person, perhaps? Is that what you mean, perhaps? I'm not sure exactly what you. Yeah? Anyway, so how do you know you're enlightened? You know if you're enlightened, uh, yeah? <laughs> It says in the suttas that uh, you know that the job has been done, the work has been carried out, there is no more rebirth. You actually know that there is no more rebirth. Uh, yeah. You can see that the, uh, the, 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 the seed of rebirth, the kina bija, the bija is a seed, kina bija, this is from the Ratana Sutta, kina bija, the seed has been ended, destroyed, there's no more seed there to actually give rise to future rebirth. Uh, so you, you know, guaranteed, if you are Arahant, you, is, there's no doubt. If you ask, am I, am I Arahant? 
you're not an error hunter. Yeah, this is one. This is one of the ways of knowing that you're not an error hunter. So <laughs> that's a very useful way. Stream entry is a bit more subtle, uh, but uh, if you have doubts, if you don't think you're a stream enter, you're probably you're not a stream enter. <laughs> but you might think that you have got further, yeah, because stream entry is one of those very, ex very, very powerful experiences. Uh, it's a revolution in your consciousness. The world is pretty much turned upside down. So it's a very, very powerful experience. You know, something amazing has happened, uh, uh, but you're not maybe sure exactly what. So. Uh, the answer is yes, you know that you are enlightened. Okay. Next one. Dear Arjan, can we make peace, be gentle and be kind by watching and staring at the plants and trees, nature, instead of closing our eyes uh, as part of our meditation every day? Thank you, Sadhu with Anjali. Um, in a sense, you can. Yeah, you, this is one of the reasons why staying in nature is very useful and why the monks often uh, will stay in nature and why going on retreats is good to kind of get out of the city because nature is naturally calming. And even if you don't stare at the plants and the trees, even if you just kind of go walking a little bit, you know, back and forth or whatever, already it is much more peaceful than being in the, in the city. Uh, so... Uh, uh, the answer is uh, yes. Staring at the plants, can you do that? You probably, you can probably try, see what happens. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you, you know, if, uh, you might find that useful. But there probably comes a time when you want to close your eyes because uh, one of the things about samadhi and the peace of the mind is that uh, sensory input becomes kind of after a while. You don't want to have the sensory input because the sensory input is a disturbance. So this is the problem. The this is one of the reasons why you, you close our eyes, to reduce the disturbance from the outside. And it's strange, if you close your eyes, uh, I don't know about you, but I, it's already a little bit peaceful because there is so much input coming in through the eyes. It kind of feels nice sometimes just to close your eyes and shut the world off uh, because of all that thing coming in. Uh. So try, try these things out. Yeah? Uh, there's, not, there's nothing really wrong uh, or right about these things. Uh, you can, uh, uh, whatever kind of helps you, and the way that you know something is okay is if it actually makes you feel more peaceful and makes you feel better. Uh, yeah, that you always measure it by its effect. In Buddhism, nothing is measured by being absolutely right or absolutely wrong. It is measured by its effect. And the effect should really be a long-term improvement, not just a short-term thing, uh, but a long-term change is really what we are looking for. Uh, of course, short, it has to be short-term as well if you're meditating, but uh, it must work over a long period of time. Uh. So, um, yeah, just experiment a little bit uh, and see what happens. Uh, and then uh, you might find, may find a, a find an, not an entirely new way, but you may find your own little kind of path through this. Uh. Okay. Uh, okay, could you guide us in the sec 16 steps of Anapanasati? Thank you. <laughs> uh, the, I, you, ca you cannot really do this as a meditation because uh, uh, these steps are very profound. So what, uh, you, what you can do, you can guide you until the point maybe where you are watching the breath. But after that, you're pretty much on your own. Yeah? And the reason for that is because once you watch the breath, basically all you have to do is just relax and be with the breath. And then kind of in the back of your mind somewhere, you know what the 16 steps are. You know you're supposed to experience joy and happiness. This comes eventually. But don't think about these things because if you think about them, if you expect them to happen, they won't happen. Huh? So you just, you just have the knowledge because you've been here. You've listened to, <laughs> you've listened to Anapanasati, so does you know what is going on? It's stored there somewhere way back, you don't think about it. Uh, but then when these things happen, uh, you know that you're on the right track. Yeah. So the guiding of meditation should really only be the guiding of the basics, so that you get to the point where you are kind of more independent, you can take off. The hardest part is the beginning. Yeah. The difficult part is to get to the point where you're able to just be aware and stay with something. 
Yeah, this is actually the hardest part. Once you get to the point where you can stay with something, then the mind usually stays with it, at least for a while, uh, until it gets bored and tired or whatever, and then it comes out again. Uh, there's like a cycle usually, you come out again after, after a while. Uh. So, um, for that reason, I guess the answer is no, I suppose. I cannot really guide you in the 16 steps of Anapanasati. Uh, and uh, you're going to have, you know, just to feel those out for yourself as you go along. Yeah. Okay. If someone f perpetually feels uncomfortable or like a misfit in the culture where they're born, uh, could it be, is it possible that they could have been from another culture in their previous lives? Uh, just curious. Thank you. Sado times three. If you feel perpetually uncomfortable like a misfit in the culture where you're born, maybe it's, it's a possibility, uh, but there are lots of people who feel like misfits in the world. Yeah? Everyone feels like a misfit sometimes, uh, and you wonder whether these beings around you are all aliens, or whether you are of the same <laughs> species sometimes. You know, you know what it's like. Uh, sometimes you can't, you can't really find it hard to communicate with the people around you, whatever. A lot of people feel like this. Uh, and one possibility is that indeed you were part of a, you know, another culture in the past. That is one possibility. But uh, one of the things that I discover, the more you look at human beings and you look at uh, you know, uh, their psychology and what people really want in life and what makes people happy, people are basically the same. Cultural differences are very superficial, and it's just a thin kind of layer on top. But really, we are, we want the same things in life. We want to be happy. Huh? We want to avoid problems and, and difficulties in life. Uh, we want to be content and find real meaning. Uh, yeah, we're all basically the same. And, uh, and we even tend to go about it pretty much the same way. Everyone has families, everyone works, everyone kind of, you know, is they, you know okay, the food tastes slightly different in one culture from another one, but that's kind of, who, who cares, you know, it's, it's such a small thing. Yeah. And um, that was a nice saying by one of the very famous teachers in Thailand, Ajahn Tate. Have you heard about Ajahn Tate? Very famous Thai teacher in Thailand. Yeah. And he said, what's the point of traveling around the world and seeing all these various cultures? Uh, they're just basically the same thing. It's still the five senses. Uh, the same thing, slight variations on the theme. There's no difference. Uh, and like Ajahn Brahm says, you know, we're in our monastery and he says to all the monks, he says, you know, why do you want to go to the, see the wall of China? Just go up and see the wall of Bodhinyana Monastery. Yeah, it's much closer. It's only kind of just go up to the road uh, and it's a road. Uh, why do you, and, and this is kind of the thing, yeah, it, it is not, okay, the wall of China is a bit more impressive than the wall of Bodhinyana Monastery, yeah. <laughs> a lot more impressive, but uh, it's still, it, you know, okay, so it's a wall, so you see it, and then, then what? Uh, it's not such a big deal, but if you get some real contentment and happiness and meditation, that's where the real, that's what it's really about, and that's where you kind of, you know, see the big differences. Uh, so the external world is just variations on the theme, regardless of which culture you're in, or regardless of where you are. Look deep more deeply at people, and you see so much similarity, and uh, uh, so much that we have in common. Uh, and the nice thing about that is also that you take away some of the barriers between people. Uh, if you see the commonality between people or even other beings, uh, you take away some of the, uh, the barriers that keep us from being able to cooperate properly and, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh. So, uh, maybe, but maybe not. Who knows what the answer is to that question here. Uh. <laughs> so, so that is the, uh, the answer. Uh. That is the real answer. Meditate to see your past life. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> then you will know. Uh. But are you sure it's a past life? What if you have a past life experience? Can, how can you know it's your past life experience? Not just a, a kind of an idea or your kind of a idea or a nimitta or, or something like that happening in your mind, a, a kind of like a video playing in your mind. How do you, how do you know it's your past life? Uh? I don't know. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> now the the uh, yeah. 
Anyway, so it's, it's, but it's a very important question because a lot of people claim to have seen their past lives and in fact very often they haven't. They have just seen some kind of mental image that has been made up in their mind and actually got nothing to do with their past life. So that ability to distinguish between what is created by the mind and what is really uh, you know, a real truthful thing actually is, uh, yeah, takes quite a bit of skill. Huh? Okay. So I hope you're okay with that, and uh, if not, then uh, I am afraid that is all we have to say on the matter here. Dear Ajahn, what is the difference between mindfulness and awareness? Mindfulness and awareness, they are two English words that mean pretty much the same thing. Yeah, there isn't that much difference between them, uh, to be honest with you, and sometimes I wish that we perhaps used mindfulness, we use awareness rather than mindfulness, because I think awareness is a more better understood word uh, than mindfulness. Uh, but I think one of the reasons why we use the word mindfulness is because um, in the suttas, uh, uh, the uh, word sati has this double meaning that we talked about before. It means both, uh, on the one hand it means memory, uh, on the other hand it means the ability to be aware of what's happening around you right now. Uh. And those two meanings are captured in a sense by the idea of mindfulness. When you say be mindful in English, be mindful of this, it means like remember it, yeah? Don't forget about it. Uh, uh, and uh, so mindfulness has kind of, I think that's why this word was actually coined by, uh, invented if you like, by uh, an English translator, one of the earliest one called, uh, he was called Rhys Davids, uh, and he was the one who started the Pali Tech Society, who started to publish the Pali books in, uh, in Roman script, so we can read them in ordinary uh, Latin letters. Uh, and uh, so he was the one who, who started with that, uh, and he did the translations, and he used the word mindfulness to uh, translate sati. He was the first one to do that. Uh, and that was quite a stroke of genius. Some of these early translators were quite good actually. They had some real insights into the Buddhist teachings. Thomas David, Rist, Thomas something, Rhys Davids was his name. Uh, he, was, uh, he died in the 1920s, a long time ago. Uh. Some uh, American writer, he it translated as mindfulness as uh, awareness mm -hmm. with the attention. Awareness with attention. Uh. Yes. Okay, so that means awareness while attending to one particular thing here. Yeah. Is that what it means? Awareness uh? plus attention. Uh. Attention. Okay, so the attention part, how is that different from awareness? Because you are looking at specific things, is that why? Well, sometimes, you know, we, we might be, that's what I think, we might be aware of something, mm. but uh, not specifically. Mm. But uh, with the attention, you know, we more focus on what we are aware. Yeah, so it's like the four areas of mindfulness, the four satipatthanas, right. the four areas. Uh -huh. You attend to one of those four. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. that's what I think. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But uh, so uh, to a large part, they mean the same thing. And in meditation practice, awareness is actually a very good word because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be aware of what is happening. Yeah. So it's actually very useful. But you know, one of the important things with meditation, one of the I think areas where people sometimes go wrong, is the idea that we should just be aware. And if as long as you are just aware, then there is no problem. Uh, but uh, it's not really enough just to be aware. You have to know also why you are aware. You have to know whether what you're doing with the awareness is suitable, whether it's conducive to the purpose. And this is what is called Sampajanya in Pali language. Sampajanya is like a wisdom faculty coming with the awareness. Uh, so you are, for example, in daily life, you're aware of doing, maybe you are kind of, I don't know what you're doing, cooking or something like that. Uh, so you're cooking, cooking, cooking. Uh, and then maybe you remember something, you get a bit upset about something, yeah, upset, upset, upset. But it's not just about being aware of the fact that you're being upset, uh, but it's about doing something to overcome the upset. Uh, and that is the Sampajanya. The Sampajanya tells you, this is inappropriate, I'm thinking the wrong thing. Uh, yeah? And there are many subtle things that may be inappropriate. Uh, and uh, so Sampajanya is quite a broad field uh, of understanding what is right and what is wrong. Uh. So these two things have to come together, Sati Sampajanya, and they often come together in the suttas as a kind of two things that work in harmony, should ideally work in harmony with each other. Uh. 
So uh, there's a wisdom faculty with sati, pure sati, just being aware of what you're doing is not all that useful, in my opinion. So you have to be aware and knowing whether this is appropriate or not, whether it will lead you on the path or whether it will lead you kind of backsliding here and uh, going away here. Uh, cl yeah, clear comprehension is, is one translation for Sampajanya. Another one is just full, of, they call it full awareness sometimes, uh, yeah? So awareness with the wisdom, uh, awareness with the purpose and uh, an aim to it. Okay, dear Ajahn, is the phenomenon of expansion and heaviness uh, of one's body known as rapture during meditation? Uh, Expansion versus heaviness of one's body, not as rapture. Um, rapture is felt usually like almost like an energy huh, in the body, huh, yeah, like a kind of energy, a very, very pleasant kind of energy, huh, and it can kind of course through the body huh, sometimes. Uh, doesn't have to be in the body, can also be in the mind. It can be felt in kind of in various ways. The Visuddhi Magga is usually the place to go. It explains various kinds of piti. But it is like the gladness and uplift inside, where you feel light, you feel buoyant, you feel good. Yeah? The body is energetic and all these kind of things. Expansion and heaviness. Uh, usually heavy, you don't usually feel heavy. Usually with piti, usually um, Rapture usually doesn't feel heavy, you start to feel more light rather than heavy, if anything. Yeah. But uh, a lot of these things that people feel in meditation practice, whether it's expansion or contraction or heaviness and all these kind of things, uh, these are tricks of the mind. Uh, yeah, the mind is playing around with you, uh, the mind is doing things because, uh, I don't know, this is what minds do. They tend to be creative, uh, yeah, and they create stuff. Uh, and especially when the mind becomes a little bit peaceful, uh, the energy arises, and because the energy arises in the mind, it becomes more creative as a consequence. Uh, so expect things to happen. Expect to feel weird things, the body expanding, you know, all kind of stuff. So many people feel these things. Uh, you may not, maybe you are, you are an exception, uh, but it's very common for these things to happen. Uh. So don't worry about too much about those things, uh, just allow them to be. Just stay with the breath, yeah? And then these things will, uh, eventually they will disappear or they will transform and different things will happen. Uh. But uh, you kind of pass through them and they become kind of irrelevant after a while. Uh. It's like the mind sometimes has maybe built-in tensions or built-in <coughs> things that need to kind of, uh, it needs to kind of get rid of. Uh. And this happens sometimes through these kind of visions or perceptions that you have, perceptions arising inside. Uh. So, um, so just enjoy the ride. Yeah, it's a bit of uh, entertainment sometimes. Uh, yeah, you see, <laughs> you see things, the body doing things. Uh, there's famously Ajahn Shah, um, uh, famously uh, the famous story where Ajahn Shah, where he had uh, one of these they, ca they call them nimittas usually in Thai Buddhism, uh, where he kind of you see things that are strange. Uh, and he had this nimitta of his body exploding here. Yeah. I don't know if you heard about that, you, probably, you may have heard about it. His, his body exploded uh, and all his intestines, all the in inner things in his body kind of flew out uh, and they ha ha hung from the branches of the trees. Uh. Yeah, so he had the kind of his kind of guts hanging over there, his heart was over there, his lungs were hanging from that tree, you know, kind of all hanging all over the place. Uh. So that would be a bit concerning if that happened, wouldn't it? Uh? How would you feel about that if that happened? Uh, why, did it really happen or not? Uh, and uh, that's when you realize that these things are perceptions of the mind. They don't necessarily, these are not nothing to do with reality very often. Uh. So, uh, but, uh, so this is kind of what happens. The mind is kind of tuned into something for some reason. Uh. The classic, one of the classic uh, examples that Ajahn Brahm tells, this must have happened to him a long, long time ago, one of his stories, uh, when he was doing meditation, he, and he saw some kind of demon in his meditation. You may have heard about this before. Uh. And uh, this demon was like one of these Tibetan demons, yeah, with kind of big fangs, blood. Have you seen those Tibetan the guardians with big fangs, blood coming down, and kind of they look really scary. They're supposed to be guardians, uh, but they look really scary guardians. Uh. And he saw one of these demons, and but r he, he r knew this is a creation of the mind. And because of the cr it's a creation of the mind, I can do whatever I want with it, yeah. So he always said he put a bit funny straw hat on its head, uh, yeah. He blacked out one of its teeth to make it look like some kind of funny. Then he put a, what is it, a 
with a straw in his mouth, I think. <laughs> Some sunglasses on it or whatever. I can't remember what it did. He, he kind of played around with it because he knew he had power over it. If your mind makes it, you have power over these things, yeah? And that's kind of the fun part of it. Uh. So I only think it happened once in his entire life that this happened. Uh, but uh, if it ever happens to you, you know you have full control if you want to. Uh, that's the mind creating these things. Uh. So, but, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so all of these things happen, yeah, and this is the, the thing about uh, meditation and the sun, yeah, perceptions arising and coming, it's part of the process. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, uh, if you are having fun and a good time, you can kind of stay with it for a while, uh, and then you come back to the breath again, uh, come back to the nimitta or whatever it is, and then carry on with the meditation. That is the main part. You can leave those visual things in the background uh, and make the breath the main object of your attention. That's what really matters. Uh. Okay, last question for today. Uh, so we have we are up to uh, we have we have kind of caught up with the ones that were left from yesterday. Dear Ajahn, when anger arises, is it skillful to say this to oneself, uh, as it is difficult in the beginning? Let anger, let's angry at him three hundred years later. The Zen way. Uh, let's angry at him three hundred years later. What do you mean by that? Uh, y you mean like. Let let me be angry in three hundred years' time. Is that what you're saying? Huh? When anger is it, is it skillful to say this to yourself, ourselves, as it is difficult in the beginning? Let angry at him three. I uh, don't know if that's a good idea. Is that a good idea? It means that you ha you can be angry at another time or something. Huh? Uh, what I meant? Okay, now. not now, not now. Later. Okay, but later. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, sure, why not? If it works, yeah, if it, it, the main point is to get, in, get rid of anger now. Uh, but um, it's not usually the way that the Buddha recommends to do it. Uh, the way the Buddha recommends is never to be angry at all. Not in 300 years' time, not in a thousand years' time, not in the past, not in the future, not in the present. Uh, so uh, ideally is to overcome the anger by, in a skillful way, uh, by looking at the person in, the, in a different way. Uh, and it's surprising how relatively easy that actually is. Anger is not that hard to overcome. You have to do it uh, consistently, you have to practice, you have to train, but everyone is capable of overcoming anger and uh, upset in their life. Uh, it's just a matter of how we look at other people. Uh, and I will talk about this tomorrow morning, because this is the next sutta, it's all about how to overcome anger. I talk about this sutta on every retreat I do. I probably talked about this sutta 30 times before. But it's actually a very nice sutta, and it's, I, I like to be reminded myself, because sometimes I get upset with people, myself, and I think, jeepers, I'm still so stupid. I've been a monk for 25 years, uh, I still fall into these mistakes, so I need to remind myself as well. Huh? So uh, it's, uh, it's a good one. So tomorrow, come tomorrow morning, yeah, if you have this question, huh? don't miss out tomorrow morning. If you have work, cancel your work tomorrow, and come to this class tomorrow, and then we will uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, it's a very nice, one of the nice things about this sutta, it has lots of nice similes in it uh, on how to overcome uh, anger and uh, I'm going to explain those in detail. Uh. Would you like to add anything more, uh, Venerable? Uh, sure? Uh, absolutely sure? Okay. <laughs> okay. Nothing. Would anyone else like to say anything before we call it a night? Yes, please. For taking uh, everyone's precious time. Uh. <laughs> okay, so I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think I have anything to be sorry about. Sometimes it's good to, uh, you know, to be able to talk and to be able to say things. Uh, otherwise, it becomes sometimes you, there are things that you want to share because it's important to you. And I thought your stories were very interesting, actually. Uh, I thought it was very, very interesting what you saw and the things you heard about. Uh, so I don't think you have anything to be sorry about. Uh, I think. Uh, I think it was a uh, it was a uh, addition to what we were doing already. So uh, no worries. <laughs> okay. So please uh, keep on enjoying yourself. And uh, before we uh, say uh, before I leave, I pay respect to the Buddha. Last of all. Uh.